Now we have looked into how we can apply the Laplace transformation to signals, to sources, to voltages and currents. And now we can go one step further and can have a look at what happens to the signals when they are applied to impedances, to resistors, to capacitors, and to inductors. Having a look at the resistors and the Laplace transformation, we simply have the voltage being a scale of the current in the time domain where the scaling factor is the resistance. And the exact same happens due to the linearity of the Laplace transformation in the frequency domain. So also again here, the voltage is a linear scaling of the current in the frequency domain. We can also rewrite the symbols that we used to write like this in the time domain as a function of time, usually with lowercase letters, now as uppercase letters, as a function of the complex frequency S. Now the next element to look into, the next component to investigate is an inductor. In an inductor in the time domain, we have the voltage being the multiplication of the inductance with the time derivative of the current through the inductor. We can transfer the left-hand side of the equation, the voltage in the time domain, into the left-hand side of the equation in the frequency domain. So that's the voltage in the frequency domain. And the same thing on the right-hand side of the equation where we got the inductance times the derivative of the current. And that results in the frequency domain in this term here. Now the inductance is simply a multiplication factor and stays the inductance here. So that one is in front here with L. The time derivative of the current is getting the multiplication of the current in the frequency domain where the multiplication factor is the complex frequency S. Furthermore, we need to subtract the initial value of the current in the time domain and multiply it with the Dirac function, which has the frequency hertz. So we have hertz here, we have ampere here, and over there, we also got ampere from the initial value, and we got the hertz from the Dirac function. I have written the Dirac function a little bit smaller here because very often people would just simply omit it. Now we have the inductor voltage on one hand side of the equation. So the two terms on the second side of the equation, the first term being here and the second term being the initial current also multiplied with the inductance L. Both of those, the green and the blue signals here, need to be voltages as well. That means we can use Kirchhoff's voltage law to express the summation as two series connected elements. The first one being the inductor itself and the initial value of the voltage across the inductor with the minus sign here being represented by a voltage source that has the amplitude of the inductance times the initial current multiplied by the Dirac function. That means it is only valid at the time t equals zero and afterwards this voltage source would just simply short out into a short circuit. We can also solve the equation in the middle here for the inductor current in the frequency domain. First of all, we bring L over to the other side by dividing with the inductance on both sides. That leaves us with the voltage divided by the inductance to start with. Second step, we bring that term over to the other side of the equation by adding it. And finally, to get the inductor current, we divide by the complex frequency S and that applies to both of the terms we have here. That means we now have the current through the inductor on the left hand side of the equation and we have two terms on the right hand side 
where one of the currents is here and the other of the currents is there. Now, as those two currents are added up, we can use Kirchhoff's current law to represent them as two different branches in parallel with each other and the first one representing the inductor itself and the other one representing a current source in parallel with the amplitude being the initial inductor current and weighted with the Dirac function. And furthermore, it is divided by S, which indicates the unity function. That means it steps up at the time zero and then it stays forever at that value. And that is exactly what the initial value is doing. It lifts, or if it's negative, it also reduces the starting point of the total current flowing through the inductor. We can apply the exact same principle to capacitors. Now we're starting out with the capacitor current on the left-hand side of the equation. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we have the derivative of the voltage and we have the capacitance as the multiplication factor, which show up in the circuit diagram as the symbols for the capacitor, the total voltage across the capacitor, and the resulting current through the capacitor. We can directly transfer the current into the frequency domain the capacitance is treated as a constant and stays a multiplication factor, same as we had with the resistor and the inductor. And the derivative of the voltage in the time domain is getting transferred into the voltage in the frequency domain multiplied with the complex frequency S. And we need to subtract the initial value weighted with the Dirac function. To represent the total current through the inductor in the frequency domain as the uppercase letter I with the index C and the dependency on the complex frequency S, we can use Kirchhoff's current law to represent the first term as the capacitor with the voltage Vc across it and subtract the second term as a current source with the value C times the initial voltage multiplied with the rack impulse, represented over here. We can solve the equation in the middle for the capacitor voltage. That means we first bring the capacitance over to the other side by dividing with the capacitance which leads to these terms here. Furthermore, we add the term from the initial value of the voltage across the capacitor on both sides of the equation. And finally, we divide by the complex frequency S and that applies to both of the resulting terms on the right-hand side of the equation. That means we are left with Ohm's law across the capacitor here represented in an electrical diagram through a capacitor. And as we are summing up two voltages here, so the second term here is getting summed up, we can use Kirchhoff's voltage law to represent the second term as a series connection in the electrical diagram and adding everything up to the total voltage across the capacitor in the frequency domain.